In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God, Amen. <coughs> the irony of the Gospel that we have just prayed today is that the person who spoke was disingenuous. He didn't believe that Jesus Christ was either a teacher as one who overarchs his knowledge or was someone that he himself should listen to. What he was trying to do was get him to say something that was going to be contrary to the law of Moses. So then they would have something else to accuse this young rabbi of doing. So when he comes to him and he says, Teacher, what should I do to inherit eternal life? You know, the, the commentary um, of St. Cyril of Alexandria, which begins on page, I believe, 265, the 10th chapter. These are verses 21 through 28. St. Cyril will go into this in a very caustic way very ascetic tongue because it's the kind of thing where here you have the duplicity of the person who is wise in his own conceit. Actually the adults make more noise in this church than the children. People who are wise in their own conceit are those people who feel that the education that they have been afforded is all that there is to possess. And, and, and think again how ironic it is. I, I use that word again for emphasis and not for redundancy, but that those very people who were entrusted with the law who should have known exactly who the Messiah was going to be and how he would appear were the ones that were most blind. Now, how does that uh, relate to us? We have hindsight of 2,000 years. You know, when you go to confession, you're sitting in front of God. Some people think when they go to confession, they're just sitting in front of a priest. Eh. The priest is the con conduit. It's like the pipe through which water flows. You do not praise the pipe, but the water. The water is the Holy Spirit. God is the Holy Spirit. He is one. And when the Holy Spirit is there, very gentle, as water is very gentle, so gentle, and yet it can wear away stone so easily. They have, uh, uh, in engineering, they have things called water jets, and they can take extremely thick pieces of metal and just cut by force of water alone through that metal as though it were nothing. They carve out uh, uh, fancy wheels for uh, uh, motorcycles and uh, race cars, and uh, uh, they do many other kinds of things that had normally been done with a lathe, but it's called a water jet, and the, the water has that capacity. When you sit and you start to make an apology for the very thing that you came to, to, to lay out as sin, um, you say, I really do not fear the rebuke of God. I really fear the rebuke of man. I'm sitting in front of just another man, and you can bet that any priest that you are sitting in front of is a sinner. That the priest may have done more things than you have even thought of doing. And why? Because he was this way initially? No. You know, the obverse sign of any coin, you choose tails, opposite side is heads. So if a priest is holy, if a priest is all holy, he knows the devil is just on the other side of the coin. It's very easy to turn it. For the person who knows God, 
It is a, it, it, it is, it is, it is the, a pure logical system that enables him to understand exactly who the devil is. Because he is not God. You see, you have God and not God. And something that is not God is the devil. There's no gray area. There's no gray area. It's like Mercury. I used to think, you know, if I stood at a certain place on Mercury, when I first heard about, you know, its situation, that I'd be okay. I was 11 years old at the time. But I thought, because it's, it's burning hot on half of the planet and freezing cold on the other, I could get to the place where the burning and the freezing came together, it'd be like 70 degrees. You know? And I just built my house along a strip of mercury. You know? and, 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 and everybody would, you know, we could, we could uh, get next to mercury, that'd be good. But no, no, it's really, really, really hot. And then it's really, really, really cold. And they're next door to each other. And nothing exists in that little tiny space. It fills up, as, as my fingers fill up these spaces, hot and cold. So the priest knows the devil, and knows therefore all devilish things. Knows the designs of the devil. Knows the tricks of the devil. Knows the synergy of the devil. Knows the logic of the devil. Knows everything about the devil. Because he knows about God. Knows about the angels. So, when you sit then and you are worried about what the priest is going to think of you, it's a horrible, horrible insult to God himself and the person of the Holy Spirit. Because you're asking for the tahlil, the absolution. You're asking for the descent of the Holy Spirit over you so that you will be cleansed of all of the things that you've confessed. But in the meantime, if you're thinking about, well, how can I say this and not look so bad? <laughs> Where do you think God was when you had the first thought initially, when you put it into action secondarily and tertiarily? You thought about it later on with maybe some happiness or maybe some shame or a combination of both. God was there in each step. So you can't go there and just do these things. This kind of duplicity saying, good teacher. He didn't think he was good. He didn't think he was a teacher. He thought, I'm going to get you to say something that is going to bring down the weight of the populace upon your head. Because right now you're popular. You've done a few things. People are talking about you. There's some danger here. You know? Um, so... Jesus, when he prays and he looks up to heaven, he says, Father, I thank you that you have hid these things from the wise and prudent. Because they were only wise, and they were only prudent in their own mind. As I say, it was a conceit of the glory that they accorded themselves because of the education that they had received that other people did not have. Other people had to work, but these were people from rich families. Remember Mark. Mark was from a family that had some wealth. He had some wealth, and therefore he could learn Greek. His uncle Peter, his uncle Peter had no education, so therefore Peter took Mark with him to Rome to preach because the lingua franca, the, the, the language of the day was Greek, and Mark could be told by his uncle what to say, and then he say it. But these privileged people, these is what we would call today the swells, uh, you know, the, the, the very, very good people. These people were full of themselves and full of their uh, own apologies for their lifestyles. Uh, just as the petition that we are circulating now. Um, but the Lord said, you have revealed it to whom? The, the children. In here in this, I, I changed the word as I was praying this. It said babes. I changed it to children. Um, I haven't been able to say the word babes since the 70s. <laughs> and uh, not uh, have my mind, uh, you know, go back and forth image-wise. But children. Now I'm clear about children. I know who children are. 
They're the innocent. They're the ones yet to be spoiled. They're the ones in whom we have our hope. They're the ones who are these vessels where they will take things in exactly as given and give them out. My, my wife took my grandson yesterday to Disneyland and um, she asked my grandson to give her something. He did and the space and the interval was too long for him to wait so he just looked at her and said, you're welcome. <laughs> she didn't say thank you in time. But he said, you're welcome, because he's been taught this, you understand? That's what, a, that's what a child is, and that's why we are to be the children of God. He fills us with his truth, and then we say this back to one another. And it has the feeling of reassurance. It has the feeling of strength. It has the feeling of community. You speak to me a certain way, I speak back to you in exactly the way that you expect. This is being a child. So the Lord said, I thank you, Father, because you've not revealed it to the wise and the prudent and the imagination of the vanity of their hearts, but you've given it to the little children who will take it as is, and they will return it back as is. You know, this uh, Gospel of Luke, as it continues, when the Lord asked the Pharisee, what is, the, what is your reading of the law? And he said, to love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, your strength, your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. You go down a little bit further. Says, but then, excuse me, one point, one point. Oh, just one, one, one small point. Who is my neighbor? Who is like unto me? <clears throat> Have you considered me? Have you noticed my rich vocabulary? My lack of stumbling for words? I mean, really, my eloquence? Have you not noticed all of these great things about me? Can anybody else, seated here now, do such as I do? I mean, really, who is my neighbor? Meaning, who is my equal? So, who am I supposed to do these things for? I can barely find somebody like myself in the world. You know? This is, this is antithetical to the message of Jesus Christ. This is why he brings up the man who is hated by the Jews, the Samaritan, who has mercy on the man who is by the side of the road after the priest has walked by. Now the priest of his people has walked by. <laughs> oh boy, look at that. I oh, sure hope that doesn't happen to me. <laughs> you know, but the Samaritan, the hated, the despised one, he, he, he takes care of him. He binds his wounds with oil. This is, this is their, 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 their primary means of medicine. He bound the wounds with oil and he gave him some wine. You know, good wine can make you forget a lot of pain. And then he took him to an inn and he said, I'm coming back this way after a season. Take care of him and I will pay you the amount that he incurs uh, as a recompense for the service that he has received. And look, what this man is saying is so far afield from that. But Jesus answers him and said, if you do love your neighbor as yourself, you have rightly answered and you'll live but he knew in his heart this was not true. We can't read the Bible as just without uh, some kind of affect. There has to be the plenitude of our whole humanity in our reading of the Bible, which means all of our emotions and all of our feelings are in it. So this is as ironic as you can get. You know, yeah, all you have to do is that. You know what one person told me one time in confession? Uh, a priest, I, I was confessing. I was one doing the confessing. And I was sitting in front of a priest. And he told me something really simple. This is really simple. 
He said, I want you to treat everybody who comes to you as though Jesus Christ had sent this person to you. Specifically you. So that no one else can take care of him but you. That's really simple, right? Everybody that comes to me, I treat them as though Jesus Christ sent that person specifically to me to take care of that person. Well, let me tell you, I've not been able to do that once. <laughs> Because at least, at least, it will go through my mind that somebody else might be better able to handle the person, number one. Number two, out of just nothing but an advanced case of laziness, I sometimes don't want to deal with the person's convoluted and, and complicated life because it's going to be so time-consuming. And at the end, it's not going to you know, achieve a very big end for all the effort expended. But do you see how discreet it is when somebody says something to you that's very simple? Very, very simple. I told you the Jews have a saying when they want to uh, put somebody in chains. They say, I hope you lead an interesting life. Uh, it sounds like, what, what, what's the meaning of that? I hope you lead an interesting life. Well, if your life is really dynamic and chaotic, it's going to be interesting to everybody who lives around you. Look at the way we see the news. We find somebody else is shooting someone, or somebody else is going on a car chase around the, around the city, and you know, like 12 highway patrol. And it's interesting, right? So it's very subtle. I hope you live an interesting life. This is the kind of the language in the Bible we find from time to time, but we don't read it in the proper way. He says, you have answered rightly, do this and you will live. But he knew who he was talking to. And if we had the rest of the Gospel of Luke here, you would see the conclusion. This person was not happy coming to the Lord Jesus. And he did not, as it says in Mark, call him good master, but good teacher. And what's a good teacher anyway? Somebody that, uh, as we, we read Timothy, did we not, from, from Bula, right? Let me remind you of what you read in Timothy, because it's important. It's uh, the kind of thing that, um, um, you, you know, Uh, no one engaged in warfare entangles himself with the affairs of this life. When you realize that you are having the troubles that you are having because uh, not of things that arise from within, but things that arise from without, you know, you, you, you don't have time for anything else. So the Lord knows who He's speaking to. Um, I hope I hope the Lord was not speaking to any of us in this manner. I hope when we look at him, we find him the perfect teacher and the one who elucidates every part of the darkness that is within so that when we meet him, we will be filled with light and we will understand. And yes, we have the blessings to see the things we see and hear the things that we hear as long as we are his children and not his judge. And this was the mistake again of this um, lawyer. He was going to put himself in a position to judge the doctrine of the Lord Jesus Christ and if possible trick him so that he would say something against Moses. Let us never live a day like that. Glory be to our God both now and ever and to the age of all ages. Amen.